So we are in the middle of a series called Anxious for Nothing. And I don't need to tell you there is a global epidemic, not of COVID-19 anymore, but of anxiety and depression. And at some level, maybe it's not an if, it's more of a when. So even if you're feeling strong today, I want to encourage you to know how and how you are going to lean into God's grace in your time of need and in your time of struggle. And before we dive in, I've been hearing so many wonderful stories about how God has been meeting you in wonderful personal ways. But I also want to say, we're not only here to experience God's blessing, we are here to be a blessing to the world around us. And we are surrounded by anxious people. We are surrounded by people who are needing the hope and the peace and the joy of God in the midst of their difficult circumstances. So every single one of us has an incredible opportunity to, yes, hear what God is saying into our lives and receive that, but also be a conduit of God's grace. We are better equipped now to pray for others and to love others and to open God's Word up with others and to maybe pass on a sermon to others. And so really think about that. But now today, as we move into today's message, if you haven't figured it out yet, the values of the kingdom of God are really upside down compared to the values of the world. Which is why sometimes the world is listening to what we're saying and they're scratching their heads saying that doesn't make sense. And that's okay because Paul says the cross is foolishness to those who are not saved. And so to, to some degree that's okay, but if we don't get that, we're not always going to be able to receive what God is wanting to say to us. And today is going to be about one of those values that really seems upside down compared to the way the world thinks. In particular, we're talking about our point of need. We're talking about our point of anxiety and desperation. Maybe I can use another word. We're talking about our point of weakness. Now, when I use the word weakness today, I'm not talking about your weak faith. I'm not talking about you know, being physically weak. I'm talking about being at the end of our strength. Being at the end of, our, of the line emotionally and spiritually and even physically. And when we are in that place, what does it mean to be strong? You see, if we import a worldly definition of strength into that moment, what I'm afraid of is those become our expectations. And so then we go to God, the fairy godmother, God, the genie, and if I pray the right prayer and press the right buttons, then God becomes the one who is going to make me strong like that. But if I don't understand what God is truly wanting to do in my life, in my point of weakness. I'm going to miss out on what He's doing or I may be disappointed because He's not answering prayers the way I'm wanting Him to answer them. So that's what today is all about. And to just guide us into this place and get us all into the same page, I'm going to be reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 7 to 10. And a lot of these passages we've, passages we've been looking at over the last few weeks are fairly familiar passages to those of us who have maybe been in church for a while. Here's another fairly familiar passage, but I really hope that we can receive it with fresh hearts this morning. So I'm going to read through the whole passage and then we're going to just step by step, verse by verse, talk through what God is saying to us this morning. So Paul says, 2 Corinthians 12 verse 7, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said, my grace is sufficient for you and my power is made perfect in weakness. And therefore I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's 
power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions and in difficulties. For when I am weak, somehow the values of the kingdom means that I am strong. So let's get to grip with what's going on here because we do need to do a bit of work. Paul starts off by saying, in order to keep me from becoming conceited. So now what's going on here? What is the potential pride that Paul is facing here? Now, if you read the beginning of chapter 12, he talks about this guy. He says, I know a guy. He's clearly from the South. I know a guy. All right, I know a guy. And whether physically or spiritually, I I don't know, but he went to be with the presence of God. He calls it the third heaven. And so I want to talk about this for a second. You see, people love this stuff. You know, there are entire bookshelves in bookstores about people who have been to heaven or have been to hell, right? And we love reading these books. If Paul was alive this day, he would have told the guy to go get a book deal, to go get a movie made about his experience, right? And so Paul is saying, he uses the term, the third heaven. And once again, people come up, I've heard really fantastical, great imaginative theories as to what the first, second and third heavens are. That tends to happen kind of at the popular level. But when we read scholars, when we read academics and people who are writing commentaries, they're just reminding us, listen, we are talking about people with an ancient cosmology and an ancient worldview, where for, the, for them, the first heaven was the atmosphere around us. They talk about the, the birds in the heavens. The next heaven is kind of the stars out there. Remember, they didn't have the James Webb telescope like we do have now, but for them, the second heaven was kind of that space. The third heaven was God's presence, what some of us call heaven. God's space, the throne room of God, where Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father. And we know that. Because in verse four, if you go back and read, you'll see that Paul talks about the third heaven and he treats it synonymously with the word paradise. So the third heaven is not like some secret society in the middle of all other heavens. Rather, it is simply when Jesus says to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, We can very quickly see in this passage, A equals B, paradise equals the third heaven. He just went to heaven, heaven, to be with God. Now, I don't know if that solves anything for you because Paul's saying, listen, we don't really know what happened there and he doesn't try and talk about it because he says this person, this guy that I know, heard and saw inexpressible things that they cannot tell. Now, if I don't go down this next rabbit hole, you're going to get stuck on this. And so we just need to deal with this a little bit so that we can receive what God does want to give us today. But once again, we love these books about people who go to heaven and people who go to hell. Now, last week I said, when I hear conspiracies, I'm not the guy who runs towards conspiracies. I'm the guy who runs away from conspiracies. And in the same way, when I hear about these books, I'm not the one who runs towards these kinds of books. On average, for good or for bad, I'm the one running away from these kinds of books for a number of reasons. The one is, and this is verifiable, you can go see these, where these books have had to be retracted because the authors admitted to making them up. The second reason concerns tone. If we think about who do we know in the Scriptures who actually has been to heaven? We can trust the stories. Well, we know Jesus. And does Jesus try and hyper-spiritualize heaven in such a way that you and I are going, wow. No, He just says, I came from heaven. But my real goal here is for us to pray, may your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. And so Jesus doesn't spend a lot of time doing what these books and these movies do. And in the same way, this guy that Paul's talking about, he's kind of saying, yeah, we saw some insane stuff, but I'm not even gonna try and puff myself up. 
and look hyper-spiritual and detract you from the real stuff that God has wanted to do in your life, so I'm not even gonna talk about it. Can you hear the tone? So for those reasons, I tend to kind of not trust those kinds of stories. Having said that, I have been exposed to some stories of uh, NDEs, near-death experiences, where, you know, there are some verifiable ways of determining whether some of these were true or not. For example, I heard a story the other day of someone who had an NDE, was in hospital, and when he came back, he described, oh, by the way, on the roof is a tennis shoe, and there's a word written on the sole of the tennis shoe, and this is what the word is. And there seem to be in the middle of some of these hyperinflated, spiritualized stories, some of which are just flatly false. There also does seem to be some truth to that. So church, please be discerning. Please be wise. Let's keep the main thing, the main thing when it comes to these kinds of stories so that we're gonna just go down four quick little rabbit holes. That's rabbit hole number one. Rabbit hole number two, Paul says, to keep me from becoming conceited, and seeing these great revelations, we start to see who this person is. Because this, I know a guy, suddenly Paul's saying, but God is curbing my pride. And these exceedingly great revelations, I'm needing to be taught something here by God. And so most people recognize that this probably was Paul. And then he says, I was given a thorn in my flesh a messenger of Satan to torment me. So here are some more questions that you bring to the text. If ever you hear about someone whose marriage falls apart, uh, I won't mention one of our rugby players at the moment, or some of these celebrities, something goes wrong. We wanna know what went wrong, right? We have this curiosity. And so we wanna know what was Paul's thorn in the flesh? And we can just really spend so much time trying to figure that out. I've heard a number of wild theories. Some have said that it's a persistent sin in his life, a sin like lust or homosexual tendencies. Some have said it's a psychological problem like depression. Maybe his eyesight, maybe he had a stutter. Maybe Paul's talking about these physical trials and persecutions he was going through. In the book of uh, Corinthians, he was dealing with a church that really wasn't treating him well. So maybe that was the thorn in his flesh. And as I was kind of just trying to come to terms with this, I think there is great wisdom in the fact that Paul chose not to disclose what his thorn in the flesh was. And here's why I want to quote Sam Storms and he says this, if he had been any more specific as to its nature, those who themselves never suffered from the same affliction could easily conclude that the passage has no bearing on their lives. But in leaving the door open, so to speak, concerning the nature of the thorn, each of us is able to identify with Paul's struggle and to learn and grow from the way in which he yielded to the sovereignty and sufficiency of divine grace. And so maybe trying to solve the puzzle, what is Paul's thorn is not the point, but what is your thorn in the flesh? Just by the way, the Greek word here used for thorn can be translated in two ways. The one is a splinter or a thorn. That's what comes to your mind. And if you've ever had a big splinter in your hand or in your foot, it can be extremely uncomfortable. But the same word can be used to describe the kind of stake that is used to impale somebody or hold up somebody's cut off head. So I suspect Paul is not so much talking about a mild inconvenience. He's talking about something deeply painful. And as we consider the deep pains that you and I are going through, we can begin to understand Paul, his response, and therefore what God is saying to you. The second rabbit hole here, or, or sorry, the third one actually, is when he says a messenger of Satan, in other words, a demon, to torment me. I was given this thing. So who's doing this? Is this Satan? Is this God? And if it's Satan, how do I understand God's sovereignty in light of all of this? And if you're asking the question, was it Satan or was it God? The answer is yes. <laughs> you see, here's what we need to understand about God's sovereignty. It's not like 
Satan's sovereignty and God's sovereignty are equal and opposite powers. And we're sitting here on the edge of our seats wondering who's going to win. If we look at the book of Job, if we look at Genesis 50 verses 20, what you intended for evil, God intended for good. We need to understand that when there is difficulty, difficulty and challenge in our life, whether it, whether it comes from your own sin, somebody else's sin, the fact that we live in a sinful world, if there is a demonic influence in your life, maybe the Father is disciplining us and we don't always like that experience. Doesn't matter where that source comes from, which is why the Scriptures never promise they will answer the question, why? Why is this happening to, to me? What we can be assured of is that God's sovereignty is infinitely greater than Satan's sovereignty. And in this particular case, Satan was doing something to torment Paul. And God's saying, but my work is greater. The one metaphor I heard about this, and I might have used this here in church before, is it's like someone playing chess against the world's best computer. Computer always wins. And so it doesn't matter what sin does. It doesn't matter what Satan brings. God's sovereignty is going to ensure that he's always working for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. And so that helps us in our own challenges. Because I know when we're anxious and we're struggling and we don't have the answers and we don't know where to turn, maybe this is just me. But so often I feel abandoned by God. I feel that maybe God's lost the plot. Maybe God doesn't care. Maybe He's helping those people over there, but He kind of forgot to help me out today. And this passage reminds me that even though I feel like that, I mustn't believe that because that is not true. And that even though my circumstances may not change, God is not only sovereign in the sense of He's up there ruling the cosmos kind of sovereign, which He is, but He's also sovereign in the sense of every little detail in my life. He is working powerfully and sovereignly and redemptively. So let's move on. Verse eight, Paul says, three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. Two quick questions. How many of you, I'm not gonna ask you to put up your hand, how many of you, either in your current circumstances or circumstances you've been through, have just prayed and got on your knees, Lord, take it away. There is nothing wrong with your spiritual maturity or your faith. If you're going through a tough time and you get on your knees and you say, Lord, take this away from me. That's what Paul prayed. That's in many ways what Jesus prayed in the Garden of Gethsemane. And then question number two, when nothing changed, when my circumstances seem to say the, stay the same, how many of you have concluded once again, well, I've prayed, I've asked, I've claimed this, I've quoted all sorts of wonderful scriptures and everything remains the same. I'm still in my troubling circumstances. Therefore, God doesn't answer prayer. Therefore, God hasn't heard me. Therefore, God doesn't care. And maybe at an intellectual level, we don't think that, but at an emotional level, we do start to believe that. And so here's Paul asking for a change in his circumstances. And he prayed desperately. And then maybe I'm sure he was asking for a different response, but something settled in his heart. The Lord spoke to him and said, listen, you don't need to pray about this anymore because here is my answer for you. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My grace is what you need. I know you want changed circumstances, but my loving, gracious, compassionate wisdom says that what you really need is to depend on on my grace, like it is the only lifeline that you have. And you need that more than changed circumstances. Now listen, 
we've got a whole Bible here. And there are certainly times and moments when we pray and God maybe leads us in a different direction or He intervenes into our circumstances and that's entirely up to Him. But there are gonna be moments in our lives when our circumstances don't change and where I'm being tempted to believe, well, therefore God has abandoned me. He's saying what you really need more than that is to rely on my grace. Now I know, I know because I'm human like you. If I could choose the answer that I wanted, I would go for change circumstances every single time. But I'm not God. And I don't always know what He's doing in my life. So this is such an act of faith and trust in the Lord. And so what is grace when Jesus says, my grace is what you need? Grace can mean a number of things in Scriptures, but I think if we just zoom out, grace is what God freely gives. What God freely gives, what God does. Not my power, my ability, what God gives and what God does. And so when it comes to my challenging circumstances, if He does miraculously change my circumstances, that's by His grace. But if He's maturing me, and growing something in my character through these trials, that's also His grace. If He heals me, that's His grace. If He sustains me through trial and builds those, you know those fruits of the Spirit we don't like so much? Patience. Long-suffering. It's His grace. If He's giving me deep joy and peace and contentment even in hard times, that's His grace. If He opens up new doors of opportunity, that's His grace. But if He gives me the peace and joy to deal with closed door after closed door after closed door, that also is His grace because He is sovereign and He knows what you need. And this is why His power is made perfect in our weakness. That is grace. Now, I don't know what your situation is. And I don't know how God wants to meet you in your point of need. What I do know is what we need most is His grace. And He is the one who wisely knows what you need best and what the shape of that grace is going to look like. So how? How can we access God's grace? So while this next point doesn't necessarily come out of the text per se, although it is definitely implicit in there, I was so blessed by this verse this last week that I thought I definitely have to include this in um, this, the message today. But if we're talking about how do we access this grace, I want to talk about three ways we do this. Number one, the grace of God's Spirit in prayer. The same Paul, he writes to the Roman church in Romans 8, he says, in the same way, the Spirit, now when you hear the Spirit, it's the power and the presence of God. The Spirit helps us in our weakness. God meets me in my weakness with His power and His presence by His Spirit. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for. I love that Paul wrote that down because half the time I don't know what I ought to pray for. I don't know what the right prayer is in the moment. But Paul says, but the Spirit who's helping me in my weakness, He Himself intercedes for us through wordless groans when I don't know what to say. And He who searches our hearts who knows me better than I know myself, also knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. God, I don't know if I'm praying the will of God, but the Spirit does. And He is your friend and your comforter and your presence in your weakness, even at the point where you don't even know what to pray. And He brings you before the throne of God and intercedes on your behalf. When it comes to these kinds of verses, you know, the kind of the um, intellectual in me wants to know, but I want to know how this works. 
I've learned to, I learned this from Oswald Chambers with another verse in the book of Luke, but sometimes I think it's okay to go, God, I don't know exactly how this works. But whatever this verse is about, I want that. And I think that's okay. Whatever that looks like, God, I don't know. But I'm placing my trust in you and your Spirit's ability to comfort me and to help me in prayer. That's number one. Number two does come out of the text from today. The grace of God's power in humility. And this is where the values of the kingdom of the world are so different to the values of the kingdom of God, where Paul says, therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. In our point of weakness, I think one of the things we can learn from these verses is if I try and and, and import a worldly definition of strength, oh, I've got the answers. I've just grown some self-confidence. If that is the kind of strength we're looking for in our moments of weakness, we are potentially closing ourselves off from God's power in my weakness. And so what Paul is saying here is, don't try and outstrong your problems. Come to God in your weakness and allow Him to be the strong one. Allow Him to be the one who does what you cannot do on your best day. So in other words, how do we access God's power? By by humbling, by humbling myself, which is not easy. We know this in relationship. We've got the South African thing. Hey, Steve, how's it going? No, all good. Doesn't matter what's actually going on in my life. And that's fine. It's this little ritual we play when we greet each other. You know, but sometimes you have a cup of coffee, you're sitting around a bra, you maybe talking outside, and then someone kind of just leans in a little bit more and says, okay, but, but what's really going on in your life? Because if someone just says, how's it? They're not asking for all your dirty laundry, just letting you know. <laughs> when someone really leans in and says, but what's really going on? It really seems like you're struggling a bit. When we respond with, oh, no, everything's good. Everything's, oh, I'm strong. Let me ask you something. Has that ever worked? Has that ever helped your situation? Now, of course, we need to be discerning. We're not going to unpack all of our deep nonsense with everyone. But when I'm so working so hard to pretend that I'm strong, I'm somehow cutting myself off from the grace that I can receive from just telling somebody, no, I'm struggling. And it is somehow when I admit my weakness, listen, this is what's going on and I don't know what's next. I don't know what I do, what to do. I don't know what to think. I don't even know how to pray. Somehow that step of humility is what does open you up to start receiving grace through God, through people. I was reading a book recently about a guy who um, summited Mount Everest and I've always known it was difficult to do, but I had no idea just how difficult it was to do. Uh, long story short, he gets to the day where he summits and for whatever reason, a bunch of you know, stories unfolded here, but he decided to summit on his own, which is not always a good idea. Anyway, he made it in good time. He got to the top and he even shows you some of the photos he took from the top. And then just as he's reveling in the moment of his summit, he goes blind. It's called snow blindness where it's literally the sun bouncing off the snow, sun burns your cornea. You can recover. Now he's got to descend on his own, blind. 
Now, this is not like walking through your house with the lights off during load shedding. <laughs> there are paths that he needs to walk that if he makes a misstep, he's going to fall hundreds of meters to his death. He's needing to abseil down icy cliffs blind. There's a place called the, the death zone where more people have died than in any other places. And there are these big icy boulders, the, sizes, the size of houses, that just like this can fall and roll and crush people. He's got to do that blind. What should have been a seven-hour return trip, suddenly 26 hours later, he's still making his way back. And he's at the end of his strength. He is dehydrated. He doesn't know if he's going to make it. He's a Christian. The whole time he's praying to the Lord and he's asking for the Lord's guidance and help. And he gets to a point where he almost settles down to die. And he describes, the only thing I can describe is, is a miracle. Because I was at the end of my emotional, mental, spiritual, physical self. And somehow, somewhere, I felt a presence with me. And suddenly I got a strength in my body and my heart and my mind that wasn't my own. And he made it back to the next camp. In speaking to his many people and friends afterwards, he discovered a whole handful of people who at that precise moment, God laid it on their hearts, pray for this man. That is what we're talking about. Coming to God in humility so that we can receive from Him. And finally, I want to talk about the grace of the cross. You see, we're going to be coming to the table just now to do what? To receive grace. To receive grace. You see, here's the thing about the cross. It is one of the clearest moments that we can see just how opposite the kingdom of this world and the values of the kingdom of the kingdom of God are completely different. This is why Paul says the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing. Makes no sense. Because if you're a king, what does power and strength look like? Armies. Wealth. Palaces. And yes, here's the king of the universe, naked, humiliated. And when Jesus looked his weakest, physically, emotionally, pouring out his heart before the Lord in the Garden of Gethsemane, to the point where his blood vessels were bursting in his forehead. And when it looked like the Jewish leaders had won, and when it looked like Caesar was the more powerful king, and when it looked like death had won, and when it looked like sin had won, when Jesus looked his weakest, God was doing his greatest. And so as we come to the table just now, I want to encourage every single one of you to come in weakness. Come in humility. Come like that man on the mountain. I just need what I do not have within myself. I want to read from Isaiah 53 verses 5 and then we're going to come together. It says this, But he was pierced for our transgressions. This was written 700 years before Jesus. He was pierced for our transgressions and he was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. Now this verse is quoted twice in the New Testament. The one time it refers to our salvation. That this is a verse describing the abundant grace that God gives us because he was pierced for my iniquities. Another time this verse is quoted to speak more about our healing. The point is this. God wants to give you grace this morning. You don't have what you need. I can promise you that. I don't care how strong you're feeling right now. I don't say that to shame you. It's just a reality check, right? I said, let us come before the King this morning. Let us come to His throne in humility, in weakness, and recognizing 
that it is His work and His grace is what I need. So I'm going to pray and then in your own time, line up just to let you know those who set up the tables this morning, they look fantastic. Also, there's kind of one little um, card that you guys can take home, kind of one per family. Would you take one of those as well? And then in your own time, while some music is playing softly in the background, take a cup representing the blood of Christ that was shed and then take some bread representing the body of Christ that was broken for us. And let's do some real business with God. The spirit that we read about in Romans 8, let's allow the spirit to search our hearts. Let's just confess our weakness, our inadequacies before the Lord. Not because He takes any joy in our weakness, rather He takes such great joy in giving us what we need. Let us pray. Father, we love you and you love us and you have demonstrated this in such wonderful ways. Today we come to you with our weakness and we want to meet you at the cross where you are pierced for our transgressions and crushed for our iniquities, where you are punished so that you can give us peace. We need peace, the grace of peace. We need healing. We come to you, Lord, with our wounds, be they emotional, spiritual, physical, And we ask that at the cross this morning, you pour out grace. Because your power is made perfect. Your power is made perfect in our weaknesses. So church, let's do this together. And after a while, we'll close in prayer. Thank you.